feature presentation. Welcome back to the Untitled Movie Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside. He's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved. Eric Marchin. Dragula! <laughs> burn to the britches, burn to the... Yes, we are. Uh, today we are reviewing Marvel Studios Echo episodes one through three, uh, which uh, all five episodes will be available to stream on uh, Disney Plus and Hulu in the United States uh, just in a couple days as you're listening to this. this uh, we're going to do a, a spoiler-free review um, of those first three episodes. But yes, January 9th, uh, all episodes will be available, all five. So Eric and I have seen episodes one, two, and three. <clears throat> we will be spoiler-free for those three episodes. Um and kind of give you guys our initial thoughts on those three episodes. So we're still missing those last two. We do not have the complete story, uh, but we wanted uh, to kind of give our, our our thoughts before the newest Marvel Studios uh, series drops. It, we're in an interesting time, Eric, because, um, you know, MCU is in a weird spot. We, we, we know this. <laughs> like, I just watched What If Season 2, which we didn't do a review of because it dropped over Christmas. We got our screeners really, really late. Uh, you haven't had a chance to watch it yet. I've watched uh, season two of What If. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. But there's been some ups and downs in the MCU. This show specifically is interesting because it is the first branded Marvel Spotlight oh, series, boy. which uh, I'm I, I understand. It's something I I talked to you about. <clears throat> I think of like how to fix the MCU or how you should have done the Disney Plus shows, and. I talked about how like the Disney plus shows and, and the movies should feel completely different and they should feel like their storylines are different. They can connect at certain points, but there almost should be like, you know, you either watch all the shows and those have a connected tissue between all of them, or you watch all the movies and those have a connective tissue. You shouldn't have to kind of jump back and forth. So I feel like with Marvel spotlight, that's sort of what they're trying to say it is by going, well, you don't need any of the, previous 10 years of marvel knowledge except <laughs> i mean when show, you do <laughs> except the show uses many characters that are from those 10 years yes it gives you the context of it sort of of all of them but like it it, it it's a weird branding thing that i feel like is very much just that just branding of being like well this is a different thing and also because echo is mature rated so that's something they've really kind of hammered home as well being like it's going to be like the the daredevil netflix series and things like the that. marvel like, knights version marvel, of yeah, exactly. disney plus so anyways i want to start with that 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 was a, a an interesting thing but yes uh we're going to go over these three episodes uh we have many many thoughts but eric how are you doing matt we're talking about echo how do you think i'm doing I, people are <laughs> tuning in to find out and that's it man so, i should have like, wore my martin scorsese shirt for this yeah, because yeah, i know it's it's kind of bad and it's bad yeah, in know, that right? direct to video yeah. DTV style. And I feel awful saying it like that because there actually are some good DTV movies where, you know, those films can be fun if they only have a budget of five or six dollars. But Marvel has the resources to make something grounded and gritty, but still entertaining and this really isn't five episodes this is four and a half maybe because the first episode which we'll be talking about which i don't think is spoiler per se Extended but half of prologue half of it is just a recap of yeah. reintroducing maya lopez echo but also sort of giving you sort of the 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 highlighted events of Hawkeye, you know, yeah. and kind of filling in the gaps of Maya's story of when she was a child growing up in Oklahoma to when her and her father moved to New York and her father sort of falls in with Kingpin. And you're just really watching mostly, you know, the last season of Hawkeye with some footage. Like it funnily enough reminded me of Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, 
where the majority of that movie is just re-edited footage from the first film with right. a few additional new scenes to create, you know, uh, greater interest and possibly yeah, you know, more backstory. Give a sequel. More, yeah, yeah. I I completely agree with you. That first episode, I remember um, actually hitting pause at when the show actually sort of starts, which is at like the 23, 24 minute mark, like everything before that is a prologue to much of what you're saying. And I was like, Oh, interesting. Okay. (laughs) Uh, That took a while, but um, all right, let's go. Um, Yeah. This was a huge bummer for me. Like I I liked Hawkeye. I liked the character of echo in Hawkeye. Um, But again, a character that I don't know if we necessarily needed um, a spinoff series for. And in these three episodes, uh, that kind of proved that uh, in the sense of like, there are some moments that I thought we mentioned, uh, we sung Dragula at the beginning of the episode. There's a good uh, moment, uh, Dragula needle drop that I kind of popped for, but um, in episode three, but other than that, I just found myself kind of going, I, I, why? And there was nothing in there that really got its hooks in me. And it made me like yearn for, you know, HBO Sunday nights like the because what Marvel's trying to do here with the mature rating and try to do some more mature storytelling and being like, well, this doesn't have to have big implications for the MCU. It's the more street level. We're going to make Kingpin the Thanos of the of, of the streets. And you're like, <laughs> and you're like street and, Thanos. You know, and these are quotes <laughs> that have come out of people writing about this and stuff like that and you know it's gonna be daredevil's return it's gonna and it it does weirdly feel like the netflix daredevil series but guess what i i stopped watching the netflix daredevil series like it does have that cheapy kind of look to it um some of the acting's not great um the storyline so far i'm like we only have five episodes we've watched three of them and i'm like what is what is going on here like what do we what am i supposed to care about and i know you're supposed to care about um uh, Maya Lopez and and you know and uh, you know, I don't know how much we want to spoil from the end of Hawkeye but at this point especially if you're interested in this series I, I'd hope you watched Hawkeye even though Eric just said yeah you get a recap in that first you know 20 30 minutes of that first episode <laughs> it's the whole episode basically yeah, yeah. so you it's don't necessarily need to watch Hawkeye you could just watch that first episode but uh, so that's why I don't know what's a spoiler and what's not because a lot of but that's also the that. problem though, right? Yeah. Because like the people that are going to watch this show have mostly, for most, like probably have watched Hawkeye. So, but I think for, they're also trying to get the Daredevil people in that maybe just didn't necessarily watch MCU stuff. But I, don't I, know. I guess, but you would think that most people that are in, unless they're children but children aren't going to watch this because parents will know that this is as you said mature rated but i i feel like the people that watched or have an interest in this watch daredevil and watched hawkeye and have watched all the mcu branded series and films so for us to get this rehash of hawkeye kind of calling or, or, or centering the story now around maya lopez um, it just feels redundant for that first episode or for the majority of it, because it's, it's really not until the last 10 minutes of the episode. Do we get the, the, the plot of, of yeah. her arc kind of going where, you know, she's on the run from Kingpin's men and she returns home to, to, to Oklahoma yeah. and she's kind of passing through and that's, the setup. So when you're watching, you know, the, the first 20 minutes or so of, of episode one, you're just like, it's to the point where I was thinking, Oh, are they going to give Jeremy Renner, um, like an acting credit for the, the, the archival footage that they used of, of him for, for this episode, because they use quite a bit for one Mm -hmm. emotional sequence and they don't, and I'm sure he'll get like an archival credit, but it's just like, it's so lazy. And to your point, what you were saying before, you know, there's only five episodes, really four in terms of telling this specific story. It feels so rushed and the pacing of it is off because you're building to certain scenes or certain moments 
where characters will talk about something and then it'll build to, you know, an action set piece or it'll kind of have some emotional weight to it. But it feels like it sort of is taking shortcuts wherever it can in order to get there the fastest. And and in doing so, it does a disservice to the narrative. And it just yeah. feels like it's underplaying and undercutting any real investment you have in this character or potential investment you have in this character. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I also found myself drifting which isn't a good thing you know what i mean when you're watching something and you're you were tokyo you're not, drifting you're not invested you're just you're just there <laughs> and i'm yeah. it's just happening and i found myself kind of thinking about other things and then going okay i gotta pay attention to this and like no plot point ever won like there are a couple good things i want to say some positive things about the show graham green a legend he's the best Graham Greens in the MCU. That's that's awesome. <laughs> like, he adds personality. Yeah. He he he's so charming and likable as this pawn shop owner and um, Scully. Yeah, and basically like he was dating uh, uh Maya's grandmother and you know like the relationship that Maya has with with Graham Greens character is very charming and warm and it feels real and and it doesn't feel coddled but there's still something there where you kind of feel like oh Maya isn't just simply a villain. She isn't simply just, yeah. you know, another sort of side villain for the heroes to defeat before getting to the big bat. Mm -hmm. And you really like Graham. I mean, Graham Greene's at great and everything. I mean, we talked oh, yeah, about him amazing. in The Last yeah. of Us. And he's just one he's of those guys. He's amazing in that. The Red Green show, amazing. You know, he, um. he, he, oh, he's awesome in um, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's just so good at bringing a real sort of, earnest and honesty to the roles and like you just i want to watch a whole show or movie with him and you know like there's some stuff from like the late 80s early 90s that you can check out but he's just one of those guys that is always such a welcome presence and so warm and enjoyable and it really does help quite a bit in terms mm -hmm. of getting you on board maya's story more than even maya which yeah, I, I mean, I like um, Alakwa Cox like as as Maya Lopez. Like, I don't like I I think she's great in action sequences. I, I think uh, there's a fight against a certain character that that I I really kind of enjoyed. There's that Dragula sequence. Like, whenever the action comes up in the show, I felt like the choreography and the and while the shaky cam sometimes didn't always work for me, like it, it did pick up you know uh the excitement in the series whenever a, a good kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat scene happened but those were kind of few and far between and then you know i like her performance but i just don't feel like they're giving her enough even though there's like a lot of exposition to her backstory and everything like that and that like without spoiling anything i think the show starts on the weirdest fucking foot possible for this show and for what they're trying to pitch is this marvel spotlight like ground level mcu kind of i i know not every marvel spotlight show is going to be like street level mcu that's not the point of that branding but i, I know with echo including kingpin and daredevil and um, and coming from that world, it's supposed to be like the, you know, street level mafia kind of all this kind of stuff, like the way this show starts and how they incorporate some more um, supernatural superhero kind of elements. I just I, it didn't work for me at all. Like right when the show started, it both immediately I went, do I have the right show on? <laughs> I'm like, did I click the right thing? And then I, I immediately I'm like, I. I don't know if this was ever part of the character's backstory. And even if it was, I'm just like, I, I don't know if it was the right way to start it. And then how that's incorporated through these three episodes and how that's utilized just felt forced to me. I feel like you could have had some of that backstory without it needing to come I'm dancing around a lot of stuff, but you'll see what I, I'm talking about. Well, it's also like, a part of indigenous representation, yes. right? Yeah, in I, terms of what you're bringing into the story. But I also understand what you're saying, and I agree with you because yeah. so the what whole I mean is that first part is, supposed... is important, and I like that backstory. But yes. adding that supernatural element, superhero element, 
felt weird to me. And to odd. a tone that's supposed to be, like you mentioned, where you have the Daredevils and the Punishers and the Defender realm yeah. being this kind of low-key stakes, but still very human, you know, maybe a, 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 a tier even lower than, um, you know, the Nick Fury kind of stuff where it's mostly just like street sort of centric storytelling. Um, and when you have something that feels like it's out of, out of Eternals, weirdly, like I thought it was a sequence. That's out, exactly like, what I thought, dude. Like, I thought it was going to have like something where like one of the Eternals comes in and sort of like talks to somebody, but no, it's, it's, it's really, and here's the thing, like the, the, the indigenous representation is important, yeah. but it also feels from the point of view of Marvel studios yeah. that it's cultural appropriation and it's not actually giving anything more than window dressing to it. You know, there are indigenous creators involved in this show, but Marvel itself feels like it doesn't actually want to take the time to really get in that. So it's just giving this pastiche of like, okay, let's get some of these images. And it's as bad as the tourists that come into Graham Greene's pawn shop to buy authentic indigenous sort of uh, artifacts and, and, and sort of, you know, decorations and furniture. And when you're watching not only this show, but, but other Marvel productions that feel like they're getting away from it like you look how long it took for them to get black widow made and mm -hmm. you know to have a solo female you know um superhero film it, it's just incredibly embarrassing that it's gotten to that point and with this it also still feels really rushed where you're watching you know certain sequences where every episode it seems like okay they're going to show you a part of of um, Maya's ancestry, you know, yeah. in terms of, of of where she comes from, but also, you know, the, the past generation and every generation being connected. It also has a very kind of Assassin's Creed kind of vibe with it, where it's like you become aware of the generations yeah, before yeah. you. <clears throat> There's no right or experience them yeah. through through the present and in the past. Yeah. Um, and when you're watching those sequences, you know, like they're really playing up the fact that it's like, oh, let's try like this silent movie style, you know, this like classic cowboy. It reminded kind of me thing. of trying to do like Watchmen, right? Yes. Like, yes. It, and then and and it just didn't uh, stylistically didn't work either to me. No, like, and... even even when it kind of changes its framing. And I know we're two guys that really love that aesthetic yeah. sort of change yeah. and and playing with the form and um, aspect ratios and stuff like that yeah but it doesn't it doesn't really work here and you know even the you know we haven't really talked much about the action sequences but they're so poorly directed and and the 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 actual editing of the space like it's trying yeah. to replicate the 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 marvel knight style like especially in the first I, i'm not really ruining anything because people know that that charlie cox is in this yeah, and yeah. they've shown scenes but that sequence where charlie cox is introduced as as daredevil is basically like them trying to replicate the old boy single take that they did in that one episode mm -hmm. where they're showing you, okay, this is, this isn't your daddy's Marvel. This is, you know, the future of Marvel where we can be bloodier and grosser and grim. But then also that totally at times feels like it doesn't work within everything we've seen throughout the MCU already. You well, know, that's like, fine. Like I, I'm fine with it getting more, violent or graphic or something like that but it does again feel you want that to come organically and i just feel like it feels like them grasping at straws right like being like we have to try something different so let's make it more violent because people liked that about the netflix daredevil shows and i know secret invasion even got a little bit more graphic right i remember but this gets really shot. graphic at times totally, like yeah there, there are moments where you think to yourself okay, are we now thinking to ourselves or even parents, if they're watching this, not with their children, but by themselves, are they going to be more hesitant to take their kids to go see an MCU movie because they'll think, oh, well, somebody's going to be shot in the face well, and Guardians, blood will... See a guy, this guy's face peeled off. <laughs> like, yeah, but that's cartoonish and over I the guess, top. But... There's a sh I'm not going to spoil anything, but 
there is a shot where someone is literally shot under the chin. Oh yeah, and, their head. And they're, it's like a Scorsese that's a very there you go. <laughs> yeah, and that's a different type of violence compared to the sure. cartoonish comic book violence. This is this you just said it's Scorsese esque, right? Like in terms of the violence. Yeah, in, it remind me of the elevator scene in Departed, or any yeah, and or, th- or Goodfellas, someone getting killed, and that's also like, yeah. a different type of violence compared to comic book violence. I agree. Yeah. So, I, and and we got a little bit of that in Secret Invasion too, because I remember that same kind of thing: someone getting shot in in the head and and blood splatter being on the wall, which is just surprising in something like the MCU. What I'm fine with the MCU being many different things, right? Like some things being for kids, some things being for adults, um, some being for everyone. Um, you know, I am Groot can live in the same world as Echo. Um, <laughs> See, that's the strange like, thing for for um, for me someone looking comes at in that. and shoots baby Groot in the head and fucking Because there's that possibility the now of that um, violence or that tone. Yeah, but the violence is always through. there. It was always just shown off screen. So like it's happening in that world. You're just happening to see it now. So like I, I don't know. Like it doesn't bother me, but it does make me feel like it they're just throwing it just being like we need to try something different and that but it makes the, it more inconsistent it's the laziest form of trying something different to me is just like oh let's make it more graphic like making something more graphic does not make something more mature right does that and you know what i mean by that right? yes when i like mature for mature audiences does not mean the show <clears> is more <throat> mature it's still very much a basic you know origin story superhero tail street level daredevil <clears throat> kind of story about kingpin and like again i i do like vincent d'onofrio as wilson fisk a lot and i like this version in the mcu that is that more classic kingpin like it's cartoony and i know you're smirking but like that's what kingpin's always been to me is like i so i don't mind that and i can see this version playing into spider-man playing into the other aspects and I, I i like that version of wilson fisk that might become mayor of new york or kind of controls new york right and like um and i think you see a bit more of that here it gets a little you know silly and, and you know we get mostly backstory stuff of of we got a little bit in hawkeye showing you know their relationship but we get a lot more of that here um of that kind of father surrogate father daughter kind of thing and like I, I don't know. Like, so some of it works. I, I, yeah, I liked Graham Greene. I, the action sequences, I agree with what you're saying, but at least it picked the energy up in this show a little bit for me. And it felt like, I know they were trying to mimic that daredevil style, it, it, but I, I, I guess Dragula just when that needle drop happened, I was like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> like, um, and then that daredevil scene, um, I, I, I did like, I, I just, I don't know. It was so few and far between that I just never got invested in in Maya's story. Um, her just kind of running from, you know, the Fisk organization. It, it felt very basic, and and there wasn't much there to me. I get going back and reconnecting with your roots and reconnecting with your old friends and family and stuff like that. Especially how much you've changed since you moved away. Like I like those themes and stuff like that, but. Um, I just found myself kind of not even nodding off, but like I was just not invested at all. It never got its hooks in me and I never cared. And maybe that changes in these final two episodes and maybe it'll be, I I, I do understand probably why they're dropping them all at once. Um, Cause I feel like week to week, if I, if I watch those first two episodes, I'd be like, I, I don't know if I need to keep watching this or if I if I need to tune in every week. I'd probably wait for them to all be out anyway. So why not just drop them all? But then at that point, why didn't you just make a TV movie? Like it, it's just like I, yeah, do what you did with I, I Werewolf by Night, you yeah. know, for for Echo. Um, I'm in the minority here. Probably I think Vincent D'Onofrio is terrible as yeah? Kingpin. I've he's just. On, on the Daredevil show and in this incarnation, I find him to be over the top and not totally. the fun way. Like, right. he talks like this and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like, it's just, it's so hammy in the ways that I don't think Kingpin here works. Like, the Kingpin that I always loved was the 90s cartoon version that was kind of elegant and sophisticated, but trapped in a body that was a brute and just kind of in 
it, it was the juxtaposition okay. of it. Yeah. Um, and I also really liked Liev Schreiber's um, version of it in, in uh, Spider-Verse and Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. Um, but that's what I always liked about that Kingpin. And they, they tried to do that a bit on, on Daredevil with like him with the paintings and stuff like that. But there's just something about D'Onofrio's delivery of the performance that's a little too goofy and i can never take seriously even when he becomes threatening i love d'onofrio in men in black i think he's amazing in that movie and i've always liked d'onofrio but it's just this role for some reason or another i kind of think he's bad um and you know like there are other action sequences on this show that really look digital to the point where it also takes you out of it a lot like there's a yeah the show's kind of sequence oh the train sequence awful it's terrible. And and the use of CG and like green screen. I'm just like, I don't, I don't get it. It, it, it's so, it just stands out more and more now, yeah. especially in a show that is supposed to be street level and feels like it should be on location. There's certain times where I'm like, this looks like it's green screen and I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the train sequence is really bad. It's, it's awful. And a lot of, of Marvel's problems seem to be coming from, the CGI, but with this in particular, it looks like something that was shot in Robert Rodriguez's studio and not in Atlanta or, or, That's a or great, you know. a great poll actually. Like that is exactly kind of what I was thinking of. Yeah. Even the way it's made this show, it, it feels a little bit almost like a Robert Rodriguez show because it, like there are shots where people will be talking to each other and the way that it cuts, it almost feels like they're not even in the same room or in the same space. And it's just awkward. And, you know, Alakwa Cox is has a presence. I think she could be a great action star. And and I'd like to see her get material that's, you know, as good as her presence is. And and it feels like there's something there that, you know, this is she this is her first, you know, role. And so, like, you can tell that there's an energy there and an excitement there and 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 something worthwhile but i don't know if echo is is giving her that and even with you know i I think one of the more interesting things about this story arc is the relationship between maya and her grandmother and that 20 year sort of difference in maya feeling like she was abandoned basically and i think there's some uh, there's 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 a an honesty to that and there's there's i i side with her and i empathize with her because you know, she feels like her grandmother, you know, basically, you know, just completely, you know, cut her out of her life. And, you know, for the grandmother to feel justified in protecting her community, but instead she pushes the people closest oh, further away from her. And, you know, Maya doing the same thing uh, with her cousin, Bonnie, who, you know, she had a very close relationship as 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 a child before she left to New York. You know, you can see the the obvious, you know, writer sort of, you know, synergy of that kind of making like the parallel storylines kind of intersecting at one point or another as it's going to probably come up. But you just feel like, again, it's not earned because you haven't spent really that much time with anybody. Mm -hmm. to really get a sense of who they are as people other than just what you're being told about them through exposition and, you know, constant sort of like, it it just, it it, it really does feel like Marvel is grasping at straws at this point. And there's this straight, you mentioned like, you know, that mature aspect of flaunting, like, Oh, we've gotten mature. Like there's blood now. It also feels the same with, them trying to make something that is more adult in that way too, where it's like, mm-hmm. we, we can do this too. We can do this. I know we have baby group, they, but we can yeah. do this too. <laughs> but then it kind of shows like, you still got to prove it to us. And they didn't hear, I don't think so no. like, or so far again, we've seen three episodes. It could completely change. The last two episodes could be fucking crazy and like, and, and completely, you know, tie the story together. That's what's hard about doing uh, these things. Uh, reviews that only have partial, like we've seen two thirds of this show, right. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, or just over half. So it, it's, 
it's hard because I wouldn't judge two thirds of a movie. Right. So it's, yeah, I could say the first two thirds of the movie were bad and then, you know, maybe it stuck the landing with a, a great ending and then it actually made the thing. Okay. So I'm holding out hope that, you know, whatever happens in these final two episodes makes it at least a worthwhile watch. It might not make it the best thing. It might be lower on my MCU rankings. I find it harder and harder to rank these shows with the movies and I feel like they should be separate. And um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm it's a, it's a mixed bag. There are little nuggets of, of things in there that, that are okay. Graham green being the, the, the shining star for, I think both of us, but um overall didn't really work for me um i i don't know like i never liked the netflix marvel stuff it never really worked for me like daredevil was awesome because at that time it was felt like something <laughs> new and you're like oh netflix is doing their you know it, it felt something new and different and 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 interesting i liked those first couple seasons but like i didn't really like um luke cage i didn't really like jessica jones i didn't really no one wanted to watch iron fist <laughs> and like and, and the defenders i never watched i never watched season three of daredevil even though people told me that that was pretty decent um but i never went back to it and the um, punisher the punisher didn't really like i liked john bernthal as the punisher but i just didn't need to watch i i, I didn't watch that series that vibe was not what I was looking for. And then that vibe seems to be like, oh, that's what people are missing. So let's bring that vibe to this. But then it just, uh, yeah, it just didn't work. I don't know. So I'm holding out hope, but uh, some of the action stuff, I liked that needle drop. I liked uh, some of the hand-to-hand -hand combat, even though I agree with what Eric's saying about how it's shot and edited. But at least it brought some energy to the show. And It's so and it's, choppy. And it should be more yeah. fun. Like you have... Yeah. You know, we keep mentioning Dragula, but you have an action sequence that takes place in a a, a skate uh, arena, skate rink, yeah, and roller rink, roller yeah. rink, and you know, hearing Jay Giles band centerfold and uh, um, uh, Casey and <laughs> <laughs> Casey and JoJo's All My Life, like those are songs that I haven't heard in quite some time, and. I was like, oh, like this is this could be something fun or leading to something exciting or at least like the big kind of set piece of this show. And it feels like it just never really gets into the the actual sort of production design of it and enjoys or indulges in yeah the action of it and like even laser quest there's a bit with laser quest where you just think like oh this could be perfect for like a weird like 90s throwback action yeah. sequence and unfortunately just never comes together yeah. um marvel studios at this point is just kind of it's running on empty that's such a bummer for you to say that i know usually at the end of these mcu <clears throat> reviews we kind of have a uh you know a look forward to and this year is going to be really interesting right like this they dropped what if they dropped this um then we don't really have anything deadpool. for a while yeah i know but deadpool's not till the summer right so and we have all the sony verse I, stuff madam web well, baby <laughs> yeah no. i mean that doesn't count for this conversation but yeah i mean i guess it sort of does with the end of of venom um and and morbius but um I like, I like to pretend those didn't happen. <laughs> um, so Don't we all, I, uh, I think we're, I think we're in a, a good spot to take a break because I feel like we need a break. Um, I feel like, you know, Deadpool will be that, you know, thing that's going to be uber popular. It's going to have a ton of cameos and throwbacks and, and, you know, kind of almost poking fun at probably how the state of the MCU right now, you, it'll you be fan think, service, but complete which fan is fine, service. which is fine. I'm fine with that movie being that. I almost think we need something like that right now. <laughs> um, but you know what is just, great? Loki season two. Yeah. So that's what I mean that we're in this weird spot. Like something that's just where we are right now is like some things are great. Some things are not. Um, unfortunately, they're not hitting at that clip they were hitting of at least consistently being solid. Right. Like maybe you didn't love everything, but at least they were, you know, you watched them and you were like, that was pretty good or at least that was really good um and then some things were fucking awesome if you were into this stuff um 
but I understand there was always that subsect of people who who didn't like the MCU and superhero stuff was just not their jam. And I finally understood, Eric. Last night I tried to – another disney thing i tried to watch percy jackson last night <laughs> so i put on the first episode of percy jackson with my wife and we sat through that whole episode and we're like because people told us it was good like people have been saying it's pretty good so we watched it and we're like huh okay we turned to each other we're like didn't didn't like that but maybe it gets better maybe episode two like we'll give episode two a shot and then i'm watching episode two and I sat there and I go, you know what? There was a a horseman who comes up, who's a half horse guy. I forget the name of it. Is it what? Is, what are they called when half or, half person, half horse? Minotaur. Oh, why no, am I forgetting? Minotaur and minotaurs are the are opposite, right? But yeah, anyways, half horse, horse on guy. top, human. Yeah, on no, it's it was man on top, horse on bottom, and um, he, a centaur. Oh, maybe centaur. Cin- centaur, centaur, yeah, cent- one of those things. So, anyways, cinnamon guy, bun. He walks into frame and you know what? I had this thing go off in my head where I'm like, I understand why people don't like superhero movies or I understand why people think it's the MCU is very silly or, or dumb or something like that where, you know, everyone has different tastes. Everyone likes different things. It's ultimately all subjective. You might watch echo and fucking love it. Cause you love the Netflix daredevil series and the Netflix shows. You might've liked iron fist um, who it's, it's really all subjective. <laughs> right. But I sat there and I, it, something clued into my head and I was like, Oh, I, I just, I don't like this. I don't like the fantasy vibe. I don't like half horse people. I don't. So like, I understand uh, like, no, no, you know what I mean by that, I know. right? I'm like, just it's just it's like, all those half horse it's, people. Yeah, out there. I'm just like, I, I, it doesn't work for me. Like the fantasy kind of that kind of stuff when a cent- centaur or a, or a minotaur shows up, and I'm like, ugh, I just don't like how this looks. I don't like the tone. I don't like the you know the creatures. So I understand someone watching an MCU thing and being like, it looks bad. I hate the the creatures. I hate the villains. I hate how everything looks. It finally like clicked with me of being like, I get why people don't like this, but it's ultimately subjective. And then in the um, oversaturation, I think like that's, that's a what big I mean. If we got a million Percy Jackson things, then of course everyone. Well, that was the early eighties, right? Because yeah. fantasy kind of became a big deal yeah. in the early eighties. It's the same thing with the Western when the and Western was and big. Superhero and, thing, right? And now, so and, yeah, and and I'm sure we'll get to a point where you know maybe 20, 30 years from now, superhero movies will be looked back upon and and have a kind of nostalgia in the same way that like '80s action movies do, um, or or the western count, or anything like that. I don't count like them out yet. I just don't think. I no, think no, the there will, there will always be we need to back off from. But yes, there will always be a place I think for the genre because it's proven profitable. But I think the quality of the storytelling, or at least the idea of taking interesting characters and building them up and not exploiting it to the last... Like, I don't need to have a show about the second, third, fourth friend of a character. Or, or villain, right? Or With villain. Echo. Like, no offense to, you know, Alakwa Cox or anyone involved in the show and some of the important things that it's uh, uh, showcasing and in, in, in the inclusion and everything like that. But I don't, it's just when we get to a point where like, oh, it's the henchman or the second villain in Hawkeye or something They get their like own that. series. You're like, you're like okay, I, I like her. Include her more in ensemble things or include her more in a sequel to certain characters or whatever. In or Thunderbolts. And, and Daredevil bring, bring her into Thunder- Thunderbolts. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Some Spotlight that in an os- her in an ensemble and, and something like that. And, and I'm all for that. But I, I, I this show specifically, I feel like is... Uh, is the, is going to be the last of its kind in the sense of the oversaturation of the MCU of like everyone was getting a show everyone's getting a uh, uh, like everything needed to be turned into content, every little thing. Oh, people liked that person in that show. Give them this. It's like I feel like we're gonna tone all of this down in the, in the sense of you know we'll get those last smattering of things that got greenlit, but then I feel like we're really gonna. Uh, scale back on stuff and 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 really rethink all of this and i know we've been saying that for a while but you know production pipelines and and planning you know usually it's like two years out right so we're not going to see any of these changes 
you know, I think this year is the first sign of that, of that we're going to slow down from these things. And I know that there's three Marvel movies on the docket for the next whatever years, but, and that might be the case. We might get one, three movies. I'm fine with that. But just like two would be ideal, right? One in, earlier. <laughs> Sonyverse though, this year, three. I know, I know. So anyways, I'm going on long. Everyone already knows our opinions on this, but I, it's a bummer for me when you say that they're running on empty and, and stuff like that. And I, but I don't necessarily fully agree with that because I think Loki season two is amazing. Uh, I think what if season two, there's a lot of good shit. I think it's better than season one. And I feel like uh, they do a great job with those singular episodes and the voice cast and the concepts and stuff like that. And um, I, I really, I wouldn't count them out, but they really spread think... themselves so thin. I think and that's, that that's the mean. biggest problem. So Kevin Feige spread thin. I think their teams are spread thin. The storytelling group, uh, everything is spread thin when you have so much that people expect to connect and things like that. I think people will be okay. If you scale back, like if you go, listen, you only have to see three movies a year which really isn't that much of a commitment right or whatever and then like, it might be a like, little bit just in terms of like i think two, I think you know two is everything. i think two is good two is i think two, two is, is ideal to me great i agree one in you. the summer one in the winter yeah. or one in the spring summer one in the fall yeah. winter like i think when you when you get to like okay well we have to have three movies a year February, or, july december right or February, yeah then july, we november. are getting yeah. ant-man four or then we're getting yeah. you know uh, whatever harry styles shitty ass brother cousin star of fox. T- star <laughs> fox is Ugh. um so like that's where it becomes like okay well we have to fill these projects so let's give them this where it's like okay we'll make them event films yeah. make them movies that people want to see that matter yeah that yeah because like guardians people wanted to see because guardians is a well-established franchise people want to see more marvel movies people want to see x-men films people will probably yeah spider-man like these are characters that are meant to be seen on the big screen you know if you want to have the hulks and the ant-mans and you know whatever else put them put them in the ensemble movies that are about like the the big showdowns like the avengers films Mm -hmm. you know leave it to that we don't need a whole film or a trilogy of ant-man movies we don't need it show up in other people's movies right like you can have this rotating group of people that all pop up which you've already been doing but just maybe yeah let's even giving trying different things and giving a random character a movie every once in a while is fine, but you can't force these things. And, and I don't know, I think scaling down is the, uh, the, un- the I not even an unfortunate thing. Cause I've said this about anything. You get too much of something and you don't want it anymore. Like I don't want to eat fucking McDonald's every day. I love McDonald's. It's just like, I don't want, I don't want to die. <laughs> if you fed me McDonald's every day or like a lot, I'd be like, oh, I'm sick of it. And that's what's happened. And like, you know, if it, people who do like McDonald's and shitty fast food, it's like if you don't go a long period without having it and you fucking bite into a Big Mac or some Taco Bell or or, or whatever shitty it's a treat you have. It's like, oh, this hits this hits because I haven't had it in, in a while. Right. If you make people want the next thing instead of going, oh, my God, there's another fucking show I got to watch. Like it's like you start to wear people out. And like, I think that's the point where we're, most people are at. You're going to have the hardcores, the ride or die people. Like I'm sort the of ghost the rider or die people, the ghost rider or die people, <laughs> which I'm part of, right. That are going to watch everything that like that, no matter what they're like, I'm seeing this through until this thing is dead. Uh, but then you're going to have the more casual people that are going to go, this is too much, man. Like it's too much. I don't, I like, I really, I don't need all this. And we said the same thing about star Wars and, you know, they step back from that. We're getting, you know, the next star Wars thing you kind of anticipate because it's been a little while, right? Like it's the next movie. It's going to be a big gap. It's like, who knows if it'll work. And they have kind of fumbled that with the last, you know, few movies and things like that, but the shows of Andor has been great. They fumbled shows here and there. I liked Ahsoka. I liked different things. They, you know, but I think stepping back in less is more is always a a quality over quantity thing. And you go, well, weren't they focused on quality before? I'm like, I think you like to think you are, but once you're putting out that much shit, it's just natural for, you know, whoever was, if Kevin Feige was the dude steering the ship, I, Kevin Feige can't 
possibly be involved in as much as they were doing right and not saying that no. he's the genius he's the only reason this thing succeeded no it's great directors it's great you know well, actors, the executive producers great. right that yeah. you see on 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 these shows and in yeah. these movies it's the same thing of like when you when you see han zimmer you know han zimmer has a group of of composers yeah. and conductors that he works with that are in his his you know company that yeah ultimately end up going to you know work on films individually you know like it's and it's the same thing with the marvel stuff like kevin feige has basically become a figurehead in the way that stan lee is he has more control obviously in terms of the film department he can't possibly be involved in all of these things right and i think weirdly what we're seeing with streaming even right now right we've talked about the streaming wars maybe we'll make a uh, one of our main episodes of the Untitled Movie Podcast. This, like, we're, we're trying to do topic-focused episodes. Everyone, that's our new thing. Um, and uh, maybe we do a revisit on the streaming wars because you got to think like all of these places are losing a shit ton of money. Some of them think they'll finally be profitable, but we're also hearing that streaming has almost killed a lot of these these studios because they all got in, invested so heavily into it and it's not working for everyone and it's so hard to turn a profit that you're talking about paramount and uh is paramount is universal warner brothers or, or warner or, brothers or, yeah or warner brothers were gonna merge or universal might buy warner brothers or like other people it's like these mergers and different things because they're streaming services and like it, disney investing so much into streaming and i don't think it's like people haven't really loved the star wars shows they haven't really loved the marvel shows right like and and well outside of that too like look at look at the you mentioned fantasy the willow revival like you've had a lot of shows on 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 netflix on disney plus uh on on max in the u.s um ha- they've been taken off and they're you know that th- that's the thing now that they're doing where it's not just simply a tax write-off thank you david zasloff a person i wish i never knew um but it's it's a way for them to make extra revenue so they can you know take their product and then potentially rent it out to somebody yeah. else so they're doing what they did on. pre-stream pre-having their own streaming right and netflix the one where we talked about we think they'd be the one that might go away they seem to be the one <clears throat> thriving again because they're the only one profitable because they've kind of toned in or figured out their thing because they've been around long enough to figure out how to how to do it so ironically it goes back to you know them being the ones in the lead and that they're licensing content from other people again and and you know they've you know they're still putting out a ridiculous amount of random shit that I never you don't even know exists <laughs> until yeah. you're scrolling through but like <laughs> is like but they've learned reality TV they make a lot of it they they focus on making cheap movies that people for for niche uh audiences and stuff like that so it's it, it's interesting we're in a weird spot but like the 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 Marvel shows is I think all, almost what is killed the MCU. I feel like if we just stuck to movies and we didn't have all of these shows that I don't think we're necessarily in the same spot. But then on top of that, the pandemic, the strikes, like all of this shit, we're in such a weird spot where, you know, right when we were getting out of a pandemic, we went into a strike that lasted nine months. Right. And that's going to the pandemic fucked everything up production pipeline wise the strikes fucked everything up production pipeline wise so like for anything to make it through this unscathed is is going to be impossible and we're even seeing other big movies that underperformed and shit like that because of it right and some thrive so we're just in a weird spot i think it's going to take until next year really to kind of like this year is going to be a weird one i think a little bit when it comes to everything so an echo uh, i don't know like it just doesn't work going back to it. Uh, I hope it pulls through in those final two episodes. Cause I, I really am not, not that I need to root for a giant conglomerate or, or anything like that, but I, I do genuinely like the MCU and I want it to succeed. I don't need it to be like the biggest thing in the world. I'm also fine with comic books going back to being for dorks and not for the mainstream. Not that I don't want the mainstream <clears throat> to be involved, but our whole lives comic books were for dorks. Right. And like, and I'm a dork and I'm fine with it being not mainstream. I, it doesn't mean that I don't want it to be mainstream, but like if it goes back to being kind of more of a niche thing, I'm also okay with that too, as long as it can survive. 
Um, and I think it can. I mean, like, we're talking about this, but also, again, going back to Spider-Verse. Yeah. Those two films, I think, are the two best superhero movies ever made. And partly why they work so well is because the creativity is there. The yeah. time is there. The effort is there. You You're can tell that everybody... You're not it out. No, ev- everybody's that, that that's working on this thing even though, you know, like, it, I'm sure you feel the pressure and the constraints and, like, you want more time. But it, it, it felt like everybody knew they were making something special. And not every movie is going to turn out that way, but at least put the effort into it. And that's what I mean by, you know, Marvel Studios is running on empty. Because it just feels like they're spreading themselves so thin that they don't have anything left instead of you know pulling to the side of the road and maybe reassessing the situation and then going to find that next thing that'll inspire them and you know gas up again and it just it's it's like they're running on fumes Mm -hmm. and you can see that with this show you can see that with a lot of the mcu series and some of the movies and maybe not having a through line and obviously there's going to be some things that will we're at a reset point for sure. Yeah. I think, right. Well, and, and, and in more ways yeah. than one, obviously yeah. with what's going on with like the Kang Jonathan stuff, Majors, but, yeah. but yeah, it's at this point where it feels like, Oh, well they, they're obligated because you know, they, they, they release so much every year that they have to keep doing this. And the bigger you expand a company, the more resources you take up, the more time you take up, the more you're considered to, you know, put things out into the world. And, you know, the quality of it, of it suffers because it becomes, you know, quantity over quality. And so yeah. that's where Marvel feels right now with yeah. a lot of this stuff. But, but the Spider-Verse movies are, are incredible. And Loki season two was really well done and felt like its own thing. So there are those glimmers of, of hope for, you know, finding the right creative and maybe the right story and giving the person time to develop it properly and not just simply give them, you know, $5 and a week to do it. Because that first episode of of Echo, I think, sums this whole series up so far because it's not even an episode. It's just a recap. Yeah. And you just watch it. And if and you need to do yourself, that, then what's the point. Yeah. If you need to do that and be like Marvel Spotlight, you don't need to know everything, but then you have three legacy characters show up in the show. <laughs> like that are like that's the that's the most things. ridiculous like it's walk like, on of a of a of a sitcom character who has their spin-off series, but yeah. then they bring back characters from the main flag show to come on for like the first episode to get people to watch. But then it. you're like, it, you don't need to know anything about the MCU. It's Marvel spotlight. It's like, well, you just, what? <laughs> and it's gritty and it's grounded, but we have supernatural elements and tons of CGI. And you're just like, wait, what? No, well, you, you're, exactly. You're telling me one thing. And then now you're going in another direction. It's, it's all over the place. Yeah. So anyways, reset point for the MCU in more ways than one. I think the future of MCU on Disney plus I'd be, I liked what if season two and you're seeing a lot of animation stuff come out for Disney plus like the next shows are, I mean, we have Agatha dark hole diaries talking about another show from a villain that, you know, everyone liked sure. But like, do we need that to be its own show? I I don't know. I I'm holding out like, hopefully it's weird or something like that. I like the cast, but I'm not necessarily after this super excited for it, but you have eyes of Wakanda, your friendly neighborhood, Spider-Man, Marvel zombies, the next shows that are all slated for this year and they're all animated. Like, so all three of those shows are animated. And is it um, X-Men in development too? Like X-Men, oh, X-Men 90? 97. Sorry. That's also <laughs> this year. So you have four, four shows that are supposed to be coming out this year. Agatha is the other one that probably won't be until like probably Halloween. You'd assume, right? Like October. So you yeah. only have D- uh, Deadpool three in, in July um there and then you have from a tour sean levy yeah um (laughs) then you have these other animated shows which like your friendly neighborhood spider-man i'm very very excited for you know eyes of wakanda and marvel zombies less so but i i'm fine with it and then you have the other live action stuff with iron heart and daredevil that aren't going to come until next year probably right yeah because they're re they're we'll talk about you know not having the creative direction because daredevil 
there's been a lot of conversations about yeah, that like having to be reshot whole, completely yeah, and rewritten. They brought in the Loki uh, directors, the Moorhead and, and Benson, to yeah. to do. Uh, uh, I love Vincent D'Onofrio's quote, uh, quote where they're like, "What are your favorite uh, MCU things?" And he said Loki season two and and uh, Moon Knight. And I'm like, "All right, it's because those directors just got hired on your show." So yeah. I'm like, "All right, cool." Um. Anyways, but then you have like, is Wonder Man ever coming? No. Um. Nova, not gonna happen uh vision quest that i'm 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 all i'm in for i think people would be down for a vision show but like well it's um, it's partly because of the wandavision yeah. sort of road that was paved for it right because even with the agnes harkness stuff it's 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 like all a part of that so it's like okay well if 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 you have something like if you're already a part of a spinoff or you're part of a like a a, a main series then you have a better chance of getting into a spinoff series, but of the stuff that you mentioned, I think X Men ninety seven is something I'm actually kind of looking forward to. Oh, totally! Especially if they have the original theme song for like oh, an they opening. Will. There's no way that they won't, man. Like a brand new HD version of that. Like I'm, I gotta watch like a recap because I haven't watched that show since I was a kid, and I don't have the time to like <laughs> rewatch all of it. But, um, but I'm I'm definitely excited for that, and the I love the tone and the vibe of your friendly neighborhood Spider Man. Uh, previously spider-man freshman year um i i love the look of that show and getting a new animated spider-man show again going back to the 90s like that was i loved that 90s animated spider-man show so to get uh a new spider-man animated that's multiverse stuff but it is in the mcu um even if it's i don't care if it's not tom holland like that's the one thing about what if season two like i i love that they brought in like they brought back a lot of people for what if and and is uh, downy so, still not in it um yeah so the guy still does the downy impersonation <laughs> and, uh, he actually i think does a better job like i i actually didn't mind him this season he's gotten and, better than season um, one yeah and i i like the guy who does captain america doesn't really sound like chris evans but it's fine and then lake bell still does a great scarlett johansson so like it still completely works but like you just think it's poison ivy (laughs) everything else uh like everyone else came back which i thought was pretty surprising like hey man um, that money that that dump truck full of money (laughs) you get kate blanchett i'm like i didn't think kate blanchett would come in and do voice what's lydia tar doing here yeah like that's it, it just seemed very much like there's no way kate blanchett's gonna do this show and then she's she's in multiple episodes and i was like oh okay great um actually speaking of to finally wrap things up um uh uh it has an echo connection too because um devry jacobs who plays bonnie in echo voices kahori in the second season of what if and kahori being a brand new Marvel uh, superhero that they introduce in that show. And is one of, it's a very good episode. And I think uh, you guys should all check that out. Uh, if you haven't watched it yet, at least even that episode. And then the final two, cause it kind of all starts to connect in those final couple episodes. Um, but uh, I, I was like, is there a connection? Like, is she playing? And I'm like, is it like a thing? But I think she just got cast in both of them around the same time. So, anyways, and multiverse, uh, right? Like, that's that's the solution you can always which, say. Yeah, I know. Yeah, she's a different version of of that character. Anyways, uh, thank you all for listening uh, or watching. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, as we mentioned, kind of on the main show and a little bit here, we've changed up kind of where you guys can find stuff. So. Um, you're listening to this, hopefully, um, if you're watching on YouTube, same spot, but, uh, podcast services, all of our conversational reviews that Eric and I do together, like this one will be on the untitled movie podcast feed. Um, and then untitled movie reviews will be kind of a new thing, probably launching closer to February. It'll, it'll be uh, more like if you've ever watched one of Eric's uh rogers reviews which you haven't Um, (laughs) which they uh, definitely have uh they're going to be more like that style where eric and i are going to be writing reviews we are going to be um doing a voiceover and kind of those should be between three to ten minutes at the most right if we're super passionate they might be ten minutes if it's just a quick little spoiler free thing it might be three minutes five minutes something like that 
Uh, <laughs> Will Night um, Swim and the Beekeeper yeah. ignite that passion? But you we'll said see, February. Like, so, I think yeah. I'm aiming for early February to do Madam like Web, baby. One. I mean, you always you already do them for Roger, so yeah. you're probably more used to doing it. It'll take me a little bit of time, and I'm gonna. But that's edit. good too. Like, have fun with it. Like, yeah, just... I'll edit yours as well. So, oh like, yeah, it, it's 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 uh gonna be a team effort but that channel will sound different we're gonna still put them on podcast services if you want that quick quick little micro five to ten minute episode but it's gonna be mostly a youtube thing where they'll have b-roll it'll have you know an intro outro from eric and i or eric or i and they'll be kind of focused on um probably the bigger movies of the year and then from me probably the bigger movies of the year and then from eric um some big movies the esoteric of, movies yeah, of the year like, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> mainstream mad and esoteric eric will kind of split things up throughout the, that channel but, but i we'll think keep... it's just what we what we feel passionate about because i think like when i'm writing for rogers i i love what i do but like i'm also writing like on a week by week basis where sure. it's new releases so you know sometimes you're writing stuff that maybe you feel like your, well, people still might want your opinion on it, but yeah, sure, like, sure, sure. But but you're you're forcing yourself a little bit to yeah write about something because you're on a deadline. You're watching something, you know. Where I think with this, we're writing it from the point of view of you know whether it be positive or negative. Because I think something like, we want to talk about a review, right? Yeah, yeah. Because like I think like what we're trying to do is like cut out maybe like the middle of the road stuff or at least leave the middle of the road stuff to for this. this. Show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this show will be Eric and I, whatever we see that week that we both see, it's just going to be us talking about that movie. It could be night swim, could be beekeeper, could be Madam Webb, could be whatever. Although Madam Webb might get an individual review. We'll see. But uh, I almost feel like we should do like something on so like Sony verse uh, superhero movies. Just not, not even as like a, um, like a conversation thing, like a main like show, after, like a main yeah, show like once thing. Venom three or whatever I the last great, one is. Again, and talking about the main show, we're trying to do biweekly episodes. That'll be more the byways focus. episodes. Yeah. So, um, anyways, those are our changes. This is our first review of the year. Ironically, not a movie. Uh, so, <laughs> um, that's the state of the industry, baby. You're welcome. Uh, it's called the Untitled Movie Podcast, but we might talk about uh, TV shows or video games or music who knows uh but thank you again um please go check out our uh letterbox which is untitled underscore movies uh we just put up uh, uh our best of 2023 so eric and i both gave our uh your know, top 10 lists from last year as well as some um uh special uh, acknowledgments not what am i saying um not honorable words. mentions honorable mentions is the word special acknowledgments <laughs> Um, and then uh, we'll have our uh, most anticipated films of 2024 very, very soon for you guys as well. So keep an eye out for that over on the Untitled Movie Podcast channel and on YouTube. Um, as always, my name is Matt Rohrbeck. You can follow all of my work around the internet, but mostly at UntitledMoviePodcast.com and follow me on all those social medias at Matt Rohrbeck. And you can find more of my video reviews on RogersTV.com slash CinemaScene and on all the social medias at EM6211. Until next time. Dragula. Burn through the bridges and bear through the bridges in the back of my Dragula. Bye, everybody. <laughs>